short of my bank account. So I did something today I've never done before. I actually transferred money from my savings to my checking by phone. And I found you That's good. Oh, yes. I do it online all the time. Well, but it's for online. The problem is, I always have trouble with my, with my um, password. Right uh, now, I'm locked out. So and oh. I just get so tired of having to call and say, can you write down and put it in your phone? I, 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 oh. I put it in. I don't know. Do you have a tech savvy person who can help you? Well, it, apparently, I, when I write it down, I must enter. It. Now, here's here's what I'm going to suggest because this has saved my life. My son put me on something called LastPass. Oh, oh I've heard of that. And it saves it. every password. It's safe, it's oh. vetted. It, if my son's let me do it, it's safe as can be. Yeah. And it saves them. And when I go in, for example, when I go into Charles Schwab, if I put in my login, my password pops up. Oh, wow. And I never have to type in my name. See, the bank, you say that they don't see that. Yeah, no, it's, it's called safe. Last Pass. I'm not sure. And you, you, I don't know. He did it for me. I can't tell you if it's easy or hard. But I oh, so yeah. do, you, do you type that in or do you no. Google it? No. Oh, I don't know. It's See, probably an app. Okay. I bet if you put it you probably put the app store. I bet if you get it. Yeah. My son did it years ago. I'm sure my husband could do it. That's what he does for a living. Yeah, no, go to last pass and have them and it lasts to them when you create a new one when you're shopping or something. It'll say you want us to save it to last pass, and you just click yes. And then they come up. And so my son was furious at me for all my cards with handwritten yeah. passwords. And I'm like you, sometimes I type it this way. It's saved, it's saved. And it saved me so much time. I have so many, I have all my passwords for all my accounts in my phone, but then I have to scroll through and type it yes. in. What's it on your Yes, yes, yeah. yes. No, I highly the only one the only place I have problems with my passwords is with the bank. Well, but that's the word. And that's the word. Yeah, you know? and like I said, my Charles Schwab pops up every time. And let's say they make you update it. It's going to have to update it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and then know. last pass will say, should we update the password? And you say, yeah. Well, thank you. It's fast. Thank you so much. That's the whole reason you put those words right there. I'm going to do it. 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 There it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been to that. 
Yeah, yeah. and it's so fun. we went. She really loved it. So the next Monday, I think it was Monday, and I said, do you want me to come, you know, let's go to the school group? Well, I can't today, you know. I've done it 13 years. Yeah. It's been more of a blessing to me than I think it has. And you're right. Everybody in the group supports everybody else. I've learned so much. And the best people who support you are the people who are in. Right. Yes. They know two hours yeah. after Craig gets to the I, he, I thought he was selfish when he said, so it helps me just to be able to deal with it for 20 years. I've been doing it for too long. But I still think that's important. Well, that's why when was the, whoever the sweet little young woman is, you call up and ask how you're very great. Yeah, bless her heart. And she asked me about the journal, like, what are your goals? And I said, I don't know. I that's so big, I can't. I'm just trying to stay sane. Get I'm just trying to stay sane and yeah, and get through the day and not be so stressed and angry. And I, I can't, I don't want to write a journal about my complicated goals. And I'm back and forth between writing a journal and writing down all the awful things I see happen. That's why I quit journaling. Well, I wonder because I I, I quit journaling because my whole journal was so negative. It is everything that goes wrong. This situation, we know, and like, and you're just life is going on. And then like today, I tried to get him to hand me one of those plastic bags out of a drawer that the newspapers come in because I use them for cleaning up. Oh, uh -huh. and he brought me a box of Kleenex. Just he didn't, he couldn't tell me. No, we had no idea what, and I was very specific. One of the blue plastic bags, the newspapers come in, in the drawer right under where we keep the dog. Maybe they were clean up, and clean up sounds like clean you know, I don't know. Sometimes I can figure out how his brain not work is like that, that. and then sometimes I'm just like, oh my God, this guy is worse. But does he ever come through the same? How did he know that? Yeah, because um, sometimes they can and sometimes they can't. Dementia varies. He's starting to slide towards the side where the answer is going to go. He does okay daily living, but try to hold a conversation with him, make a simple comment when you're watching television. He gets to the do it. Sometimes it's fine. Yeah, I quit doing it. I filter it. I'll think something I'm going to say, and then I'll think, you need to go off. I'm still thinking of it. I don't have too many things to do. It's my work at home, but it was sweet that I'm so glad since, mainly since Christmas. Um, before Christmas, you know, you know, there were some things going on, but I was on my knee thinking, why didn't they say it? It's not there. Yeah, it's not it's ugly, 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 ugly. Yeah. But, but the other side of it is, you know, when, when they first said, I had a couple of days where I thought, well, this is a life sentence. And then I thought about a sister who's been dealing with Lewy body disease, um, and she's way younger than her, her husband, way younger than I am. I think about two friends who have severely disabled children. That's truly a life sentence. And I try to say, <laughs> until now, your life's been pretty good. It doesn't go a whole lot. It doesn't. I agree with you. In anger, I retired in May and was diagnosed with August. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. So, the so word I was you were forward to. I was going to travel with my sister and do some fun things, and that's been severely curtailed and then you throw in the pandemic. And yeah, I spend a lot of time angry. And the other day, I was like, um, I know I respond with an angry type of voice. To the stupid things that he says, and they're just like sometimes they're just stupid. You're just in your brain here. And I walk in the closet and mumble. And I say, I do I do too, but it's really hard. And I've been out five years. The hardest part is giving yourself grace. Yeah. Grace because you're human. And we don't know always the best way to respond. And even if we do know the best way to respond. We can't always make ourselves do that because no. we're human. No, no, no. And so we have and, to give ourselves grace. And in this, I mean, I dealt with the nearest side come to this is dealing with, um, as a school administrator, with, with um, 
emotionally. That's mm -hmm. what I did for kids yeah. 27 years. And and I find myself, you know, what little thing can I create to help him? And in some ways, he's not, I think he's far along very short as we've known about it. But in other ways, he can still behave places and people can still enjoy talking to him and to them. But in other things, he's just, and I resent that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm tired. And I'm getting ready Not to go you. the 31st of May. I'm going to spend a week with my son in California in January. And I struggled with him not take, trying to take him, which could be a nightmare. Are you flying? Yeah, I'm flying and I have to make I have to make connections in Phoenix. And is he going with you? No. Okay. No. No. Yeah, that yeah. would be that would be a lot. Yeah, no. I'm coming to take us to Raleigh next year. I thought, I don't want to drive by myself. He still drives, except the problem is if you get in any kind of, um, and there are a few places along the way where it's kind of finicky how you go. And if I say, if I see he's doing something wrong and say something, just stops. And I think, you know, you're oh, super that. dangerous. Yeah. And then I thought on a plane. <coughs> and that, you know, so my, our daughter's flying out. Maybe we'll just stay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a perfect example of social connection. So I thought about a couple of times stopping and saying, you guys can start another class, but we humans need each other. We all need each other to different degrees. And everybody needs um, in their life a person who understands them. And understands where they're coming from. And that's what this class kind of is about. If you I haven't been there, even, even though the people say, oh, I know what you're going to no, no, no. Is anybody else tired of I'm so sorry? Oh, yes. my gosh. I heard that so many times. I, I, I just, or why can I get any help? And then they don't know. Well, they don't know what. Well, I don't know what to tell them somehow yeah. because yeah. it's the spur of the moment when I have a something here. here. Yeah. Huh? Period. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Make this go away. Make this go away. No, that was hard at first. But now I just say, just keep on being with them. Mm -hmm. Don't desert us. You don't have to do anything special. You know, just keep it down. Yeah. But you know, the, and I was telling my friend yesterday, he's out with way longer than I have. I said, there have been some pluses. Ones I, I've had to do some things that I haven't had to do before. And like you with your, phone in to the, yeah. to the bank, kind of proud of myself. And the other is, and this group's a good example, how incredibly wonderful people have been. When I call, when I call a company and say, you know, I'm really sorry, this is what we do, <coughs> my husband is forgetting, I don't know how to do this, could you help me? Because they're going to get overly charged, they almost do that without even being asked, they help me and They'll talk about their dad or their family. I had that happen a lot of times. My mom had her gas turned off. So, yeah. But people basically, I don't even come in and ask you to do some other things. Well, and what you were saying from the support yeah. group, I know what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I do it and I do it and I do it. And then I encounter something and, you don't. and I just lose it. Mm -hmm. I um I remember when I was caring for my dad, I thought, you know, I worked I worked in long term care for oh, wait, 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 oh wait. I'm sorry, no, I did the wrong thing. I thought oh. I'm gonna find my support group. I'm gonna say yeah, that's you for the set of rules. So I, what was your sign up after that? Oh my dad. <clears throat> I have been in long term care in the industry of long term care for 13 years with my dad. I'm sick. Um, and I thought I knew everything about dementia, you know. I kind know how I could listen to mm -hmm. I it is my patients and friends so much. And I mean it's different when it's when it's someone close to you. Mm -hmm. You can logically know how you're supposed to respond if there's mm -hmm. certain this behavior or that behavior, or how not to argue and how. To redirect and blah, 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 all that stuff. 
But when it's your mom or it's your dad or it's your husband or it's your brother or your sister or somebody you've had a long relationship with, it makes it hard to transition from your old relationship to this mm -hmm. whole new right. reality. Mm -hmm. Well, and they're not mm -hmm. the same person. Not right? the same. They can't think the same. No, they can't do so as they once did. It's so hurtful. It's so hurtful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. They don't treat you that way. Yeah, it is. Yep. It's so hurtful. Yep. Yeah. Very passive aggressive. Yeah. 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 I understand completely. Yeah. Um, and then you feel guilty. I mean, you for me, I feel guilty. Mom, you know, and then I need to, you know, I know that she couldn't move any faster or she couldn't, you know, connect, but then I would just get really irritated. Yeah. And then I feel bad that I was irritated with my sweet mom. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I feel guilty. I, uh -huh. It's the same kind of thing when you're parenting toddlers or babysitting or whatever, you know, you snap at them and they're like, oh, they're just kids or whatever, right, you right, know, or right. best friend or whatever it may be mm -hmm. that, you know, I shouldn't have done that. We always say when we ask ourselves, but um, so today's class is on social connection. Um, before we really dive into that, I kind of, I know that we've been doing like little recaps and like talking about the last class and the last outing and stuff. So um, tell me, I, I, didn't, I didn't sit in on the nourishment class or anything like that. Did you feel like that was helpful? Sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. 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 I've changed my thinking. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Wonderful. I spinach as soon as I got it on my made stir fry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> spinach is such an easy add into things that you never even think of. I threw some MS. I always love smoothies. I love like bananas, strawberries, oh, and stuff too. in a smoothie with some almond milk. I never even thought of adding spinach. You don't, even you don't even taste it. You have to get over the greenness. <laughs> you know, I do it in what, like one about this whole, and I always think that's been one healthy. Well, they, by those directions, that's the same way. They can't be smoking. Yeah. I use it for my whole breakfast. Yeah, I think that um, the portion sizes is probably the most important thing exactly. um, that, that I've learned. But if you kind of go overboard on a portion of something, it's better to do on a fruit and vegetable than right. it is on anything else. <laughs> so, you know, fruits and vegetables, um, I'd say most people are pretty safe doing more portions. Of I know I don't eat enough vegetables, but if I have a regular salad and, and maybe I've been, I've been eating more fish now and not breaded, and then I'm full. Mm -hmm. I really don't want any more, you know. So I'm not. I have to figure out ways of getting vegetables, maybe for lunches. Yeah. 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 There's. I just want to share that I'll shut up. <laughs> there is a peanut butter that my daughter introduced me to. Has anybody heard of American Dream? Mm -hmm. You need to Google it. It is the best natural, no sugar, no artificial ingredients, no gluten. It is expensive. It's $12.99 a jar. It's about the it's day, but it lasts a long time. There's 10 grams of protein. Some of them have 12 grams of protein. Um, there's only seven grams of sugar in some of them, but um, they have thicker that thicker than a snicker. And oh my gosh, <laughs> and they have some more, they have all different kinds. They have peanut butter and nut butters. And it's great on an apple. Or celery. Mm -hmm. American, I do, I do almondy almond butter, which is almonds. American only, dream. Almond. And it's made here in Indiana. And it's locally, it's locally made. But I don't, because I have two kinds of ideas, I have a difficult time getting enough protein. So that's how I've been able to get it. But I highly recommend it. It's delicious. And you can get on a reward program and they can be in the $10 off and that kind of thing. So everybody, so everybody felt like the, the nourished class was helpful. Did you guys like the um the uh filter? Oh my gosh, that was one everybody had to bring dishes and share. Yeah, that was fun. I heard that was really actually a, a great place to really see how you guys have kind of connected socially with each other. There's like um, little micro friendships that are related to this. Um, to this group that have kind of formed over the course of the of the time, and those kind of things are good. And and some of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, you'll like um, this class has kind of become a ritual for you guys. You know, every Tuesday at this time, we've got something going on, and, and you're going to go. You know, and so 
<laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about how rituals play a role in um, social engagement and um, in connection. Um, section we are on section number. There we go. Yeah. I got it. Okay. <clears throat> I, we heard we have a speaker, and this is going to be pretty uh, informal, just because to say, you know, I don't like to be married to a PowerPoint, and I don't like to just like read a PowerPoint to people, and so I'd rather share ideas and share thoughts about different um, the different topics that that we're going to talk about. But can this, I have a judge? Sure. This has driven me crazy. Like as a retired educator about high school kids. I don't know how many times I've told sweet little Mary Grace, please stop reading PowerPoints to me. Yes, I can read them faster <laughs> than you can read them to yeah. me, and I read quite well. We all do. And um, at least two or three of them I have wanted to revise so badly. Yeah. And get rid of the full sentences and give us the bullet points. And this is fabulous. Oh, I, good. I would give you a very high mark. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just have to say thank you. Oh no, I cannot stand it. I, I hardly ever use PowerPoints just because I I'll, I'll be click through and I'll click to the next slide and like oh I already said it. <laughs> I already said that one. Oh never mind. Let's keep going. Yeah. But um uh, but one of the we saw a speaker of um from I forget I can't remember what um he was like a folklorist. Anyway, we had a, a dementia friendly Orange County kickoff event because um, my name is Diana Matthews, by the way. And I guess we should start there. My name is Diana Matthews, and I'm the project director for the Rural Dementia Network, which is an extension of the Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Service. We wrote her first grant, and myself and my colleague, Shelly Gilbert, who was in the uh, rest and sleep. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, okay. so she, she and I focus on. The, basically doing the same things that Dana and Amina do, but we focus on Lawrence and Orange County and those rural communities. Um, so my background is in skilled nursing um, and uh, assisted living, but as an admissions and marketing person, not as a nurse. Um, so I, I play a nurse on TV, I play a lawyer, I play a doctor, I play everything, but I am none of those things. I am just a marketer <laughs> who probably knows a little bit about everything and enough to be dangerous. Um, so that's who I am. And I don't I, I don't know everybody's names. I, I saw you had a name tag somewhere. No. <laughs> yeah. Carla one day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, who else? Yeah. So I, I do know Carla, but maybe we could what is your name? I'm sorry. I'm Carolyn. Carolyn. Carla Carolyn. Roberta. Roberta. Pam. Pam. Mm -hmm. Leanne. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Okay, I, I just don't remember any of them. No. Carla, Carolyn. Roberta, Pam. It's two words, but it's really because it's spelled different. Leanne and Mary Lou. I knew there's this last two were two words, but Leanne and Mary Lou. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, back to what I was going to say. This guy was talking about music and how music and memory and art and involvement in arts and things like that is helpful for your brain. And he said that. A quote that I've never heard before that gerontologists say the three biggest ills of aging are loneliness, helplessness, and um, lack of purpose. Mm -hmm. I see that. That's so true. Yeah. You said so, they were the three biggest dangers? They were ailments, oh, ailments, yeah. ailments, plague. And he called them plagues, the plagues of aging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The loneliness is what we're going to talk about today. Of today, and so not everybody needs a ton of, to be around a ton of people. But what but what we have um, found out that the risk of isolation <coughs> and loneliness increases as you get older, mainly because of life events that happen mm -hmm. that cause you to change some of your daily habits and daily behaviors. Um, so we are instead of you know, doing that, we want to connect to protect because having connections, social connections, family connections, friend connections, church connections, support group connections, whatever connections you may have in your life, protect your brain. Um, they uh, keep new, they allow new pathways to be formed in the brain. They keep you um, 
the other brain fog and to be communicating um, and to be feeling alive and having purpose. Um, so these, you know, I have to tell you, I let the, some of the stuff I let the interns do to me. And I felt like, this, I just looked at this today, we had interns working with us, as you know. First three slides are so depressing. One third of Americans over 65 years of age live alone. I think that's depressing, that's sad. But is it, is it stupid to say I wish I lived alone? No, because, no, I wish I lived alone too. <laughs> But I don't want to be alone all the time. I just right. wish I could be alone when I want to be alone. <laughs> but that, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about is the difference between being alone and being alone. Because we get different between those two things. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, bring another chair around. I guess one. There was somebody who, what, who said they couldn't be here today, but the teacher that's not here. I can speak in right now. Oh. <laughs> um, so we're talking about um, social connection. Um, the, the reason that uh, a lot of Americans live alone, of course, is either they've been single their whole life or they've been in a, a, a relationship, a marriage, or a spousal relationship, and that person has passed this way. Uh, all of us are going to probably, at some point or another, end up either living alone or leaving someone to live alone um, if you're in a relationship or choosing to live alone at some point. Um, so there's a, an inherent risk of, of loneliness when you're getting older. Um, oh, half of Americans over 85. Yes, that seems like me too. But a lot of people, when they age, they can move into family members or they may move into retirement communities. Yeah, things like that. What's really amazing to think of is half, because I teach dementia family classes, and if half of Americans over 85 years of age live alone, we also know statistically that one in three people over the age of 85 have a dementia on them. A lot of people are struggling with living alone with brain changes. <clears throat> and in the first six months after losing spouse, there is a 41 percent increased risk of mortality. But who, who might um, have an idea of why that's the case? Could be loneliness as a factor for sure. Stress could be stress, stress of life changes. For me, it's sort of unfair that the men who can't take care of themselves. Yeah. Or the one who's dependent on the other person. Dependent on the other person. Yeah. The, the, the interdependence that, that often happens in marriages. I would also guess that a lot of times it's because of the toll that caregiving for the person had, had taken on the, um, the survivor. We do know that caregivers um, undergo a tremendous amount of stress and oftentimes do pass away before the person they're caring for. But when they, that, that's what happened. My, my father, not going to give my dad as an example, because he took care of my um, stepmom. She had ALS. Oh, he was our primary caregiver. You know, he was our primary caregiver for she was sick for about maybe 15 months with it. And then within eight months after her passing away, um, he was gone. And he immediately started declining cognitively. But we think that actually he was very declining cognitively, but we were all focusing on my stepmom who was dying physically, but fine cognitively, you know, and so. Um, we probably just didn't notice that dad was slipping in until he was on his own. It never became obvious. But, um, but I would say that loneliness does contribute. And there's a, um, when, a, when people are married and used to being around each other, the, the sense of loss, of you finding yourself suddenly alone and not knowing what to do with yourself, I would imagine, really. Um, They've done a lot of studies, um, actually, on the um, on the effect of isolation, and have really found that it affects a lot of different areas in your body. It affects your immune system. Um, it affects your stress level. It disrupts your sleep. It um, uh, increases the chance of depression. Um, there's, you know, all these uh, big. Numbers for 29% increase in heart disease, 32% increase in stroke. It's a lot of 
like a lot of, um, I, I told the girls in their IP, these first few slides are so depressing. You know, it's like. On, on that side, for example, I have a sister who has had two divorces and we kind of lost their marriage. It's a tentative divorce. And she's very independent and very determined. Um, I know she said to me once, and it's just not true, but I don't want to have any man around me. But does this mean people who have chosen, and she loves me, no, yeah. she went to France. She's really, you know, moved away from us. Now that we, <coughs> we don't like each other so long, because we do. But or is this more like if I would lose my husband? Right now? This is more if you feel isolated. It's more about your internalization of being alone, because there's a difference between alone and lonely. There's a difference between um, kind of being a private person and feeling isolated. Um, there's a difference between um, there's a rejection level that, that is there with isolation. Um, you feel cut off and sad about it. There's a difference between that and being a hermit who loves to do painting projects by herself all day. You know, that's different. That's a different thing. So we're so, talking about people who are isolated, who are really have nobody to rely on. So one of the weirdnesses of living with person as dementia is that you're alone, but not alone. Right. You feel, a lot of people living uh, who are caregivers of people living with dementia report extreme isolation. A lot of might say they're very lonely. Yeah, extreme isolation. Because you're right, people think, well, you're not alone, you got that, or whatever, but you are alone. You don't have, and, and look, that's why support groups are so important for caregivers, um, because that isolation is very real. That's why we work so hard at creating dementia-friendly community spaces, so that people who are living with dementia, their caregivers can take them places and not uh, fear that if something was to go wrong, people wouldn't know what to do or respond or be upset that they're at the restaurant or whatever. You know, we, we want to get more dementia from the public spaces so caregivers are not so isolated so they can do things that they would normally enjoy doing even with the person living with dementia. So I still say one caregiver has to have help. Yeah, they do. A caregiver, one person cannot do it. Yeah. You're gonna run into problems. Yeah. And the caregiver that I hired told me. That person does not want a stranger coming in. Nobody wants a stranger coming in, but you've got to do it. And it was interesting, that person that we hired um, to come in, even if it's four hours a day or every other day, four hours, that is a tremendous burden off of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you just got to do it. You do. You do. Um, when you 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 can't um, we can't bear the burden of the world on our shoulders. We have to have each other. We need help. help. I mean, it's yeah. so important. We need help. It's a twenty-four hour. Or, yes. It's a twenty-four hour and three hundred sixty-five day a year job. Mm -hmm. You handle everything. everything. So you you're doing to what have. he used to do mm -hmm. and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. You've got to have trusted person to help you. Even if you pay him. Yeah. <laughs> even if you pay him. Even if you pay him. Well, it's just so important. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. The other thing that I would say in terms of dealing with that would be people that can call on the phone and say, I just need to talk to this right. person. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a walk. Just talk to me. Mm -hmm. this, this happened and it was just shit crazy. Yeah. And I just need to talk. Yeah. My, my daughter is very good at that. My sons will listen. They don't like hearing about it as much. Mm -hmm. And my sister is just like, even if it's a health line, you got to talk. Yeah. 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 We we do, we really do need a, a tribe of some sort. And, it's, and, and our people are different in different areas of our lives. So you may call your daughter or your sister when you're having a problem with him, but 
um, if something else was going on, you may have another tribe of people that you right. call and talk about something else. You know, I mean, right. you can have different social circles. They don't all have to be interconnected. But having having someone who has your back um, is what really makes uh, um, social connections important to bring home. If you have somebody that you know that you trust, that no matter what, you can call and they will be there. Just even if it's one person. And having four is better. <laughs> having four is better. <laughs> having four is better. But if you at least have one, yeah, so that's that's helpful yeah. for brain health. Yeah. Um, there was a study, um, some risk reduction stuff. There was a study that um, Harvard did about adult development, isolation, um, uh, and social connection. And they found that it doesn't really matter, like I said, how many friends you have. It's the quality, that one quality relationship that you can really lean into is what really, really matters. And if you can have 10, you can lean into great. Some people aren't built that way. That's okay too. But you, but the, the fact that you have a relationship that you can lean into and really rely on is what the researchers found um, uh, is protective to brain health. And if you keep that relationship and lean into it into your 80s, there was a dramatic difference in the health of people who had that kind of a strong relationship. So cultivating those relationships now while you're younger and leaning into those relationships so that as you age, you already have these relationships in place. And then prioritizing them because it's also very easy to let them slip, you know? Um, it has to be, it's a, it's a conscious effort. They have found when they've done some studies, um, I forget who did the study, but that children, they studied the fact of children who felt isolated, um, like either at school, like being bullied or isolated as being an outcast or whatever. Their brain had the same response receptors going off as physical pain. So feeling isolated is very detrimental when it comes to your brain health, because as we know, stress is very detrimental to brain health. Um, and so making sure that you feel a connection to another human being is really vital. And like I said, you can have 10 great, but you, as long as you have one, that's really, really key. I can ask a question. Absolutely. Because when I was telling my doctor, and she very good. I like her. She's moving, but oh well. Um, but I was telling her about the stress. She offered pills. Um, Zoloft, I think. And I agonized over it, and I, I concluded, I don't know how pills going to solve what I'm dealing with. And I kind of don't like, I never liked taking painkillers or something that made me feel sort of out of control. And I, I decided not to do it, but I just wondered other, if you had any thoughts on that, if that can help your brain. No, I, 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 I don't I, I don't have any research to back up that Zoloft doesn't help your brain, right. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. Zoloft can really help with, with clinical depression. Right. And with chronic um, anxiety, like with um, anxiety panic disorder, things like that, there's lots of things that are chemical, can be chemically controlled. But um, if you are feeling isolated and overwhelmed, maybe it could numb those receptors a little bit, but that's really solve your problem. That's really solve your problem. Yeah. 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 I, I think you're. Um, but social connections can combat brain fog. So if you're feeling kind of foggy, reaching out to a friend and just chit-chatting, not about anything necessarily, but maybe about the weather, can help your brain fog clear up. You know, and sometimes we get brain fog just from being so immersed in our day and, and trying so hard to keep all of our balls up in the air that it makes your brain just kind of get fuzzy. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm coming or going. So, so um, really being in a securely attached relationship with another person is, is pretty important. And making those connections that matter. So fostering those relationships that are really important to you, making sure that you that those relationships become a relationships become a priority in your life. We were just talking about that lunch, and you know, Dana um, um, shared with me, she's like, how do you prioritize when everything seems like such a priority? You know, um, you've got you've got you know, for her, for instance, she's got young children, she's got all their 
school obligations, sports obligations. She's got her husband. They've got a business. She's got her friendship. She's got her work. She's got her volunteer. You know, and and they all are competing priorities. Mm -hmm. um, but making room for that one relationship that's really important to you is um, is worth it's worth your effort and your and your time to make room for that. We're going to talk a little bit about ritual in a few minutes about how like a Monday girls night or a, a first Friday fun day or whatever, just it, it, having rituals that you do. Maybe it's a, a sister Sunday or what, just even name, even if you don't name it something silly, but like for instance, I live, it's, they, they wanted me to do this social connection class because I live in an intentional community. I live in a commune. So they're like, oh, you got all social connections. I love to stay home and draw my blinds. I'm like, so, um, you know, okay, yeah, I, I have social connections. I have lots of them. I have rituals. We have a taco Thursday, every Thursday night in our communal building. Everybody brings kitchen and we have a big taco night. You know, I mean, we have things we do at every single point. My kids grew up, my husband, ex husband's family had um, Thursday chili at his parents' house every Thursday night. His parents are gone. On now, and they still have another sister took it up or whatever, but they have Thursday night chili. So those kind of ritualistic things that you, it's important to prioritize them in your life and to make sure you lean into those relationships and maintain that connection somehow. And I think that, you know, I found when my husband died uh, that I had friends stepping up to the plate. I mean, and I was just taken aback because you know, these are friends. Some of these were friends that I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was particularly close to, but because they stepped up in that period, mm -hmm. now they're my really good friends, right. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, sometimes it's unexpected. It comes from an unexpected right. place. You, they do say that, you know, you really know who your friends are when you're going through a bad yeah, time, exactly. you know, who's, who's stepping up, who's, say, who's, who's showing up. Um, you know, showing up is half the, um, half the battle. If you've got somebody who's always showing up for you, that may be a relationship that you want to foster and lean into a little bit more, you know. I'm interesting when I was a former teacher, I was mentoring a little bit of a student. It took her a while to figure out she wanted to go to school. She's a very good student. Mm -hmm. And I was mentoring her, trying to get her on a pathway so that she would have, mm -hmm. actually, I'm trying to help her also step out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And we have become extremely good friends. Mm -hmm. Not just mentors, mm -hmm. but good friends. Mm -hmm. And I know she will help me and I will help her. And we laugh during the pandemic. She and I, I like Blake Shelton, she likes Princeton. <laughs> 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 or that or because they are from the wrong, you know, they'll think I'm from the wrong side of the track or they're so much better than me or they're so much older than me or they're so older as a man and I'm a woman or whatever. Take away the, if you connect with somebody, lean into that and, and allow that to become important to you and then prioritize, even if it's just a quick phone call now and then. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, like, I had to do this with my son, I'm, although we've kind of gotten out of the habit lately and I need to get back on it, but I said, honey, I don't care if we talk, we don't talk for six weeks. Just text me every Sunday and they're doing okay and mm -hmm. you're still alive, you know? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes even a text message is enough right. to make you feel a connection to a person. I have a girlfriend that was one of my best friends at my previous job. Um, and I quit it right before, the, right at the start of the pandemic. And um, we have not seen each other since. But every day, at least two or three times a day, we send each other memes, funny memes mm -hmm. that remind us of each other. Right. We don't even talk, I don't even know if we've talked on the phone in two years. I feel just as close at her as I did when we saw each other almost every day. 
you know, because we kept that connection, whatever works for you to feel connected to somebody. And even though we haven't talked on the phone or seen each other in two years, we send memes enough and text just, hey, how are you doing? Or I saw that picture. Did you? Or it's like, you see someone saw this picture on Facebook. Oh my God. It's <laughs> kind of, it's kind of bad. <laughs> Go down the, <laughs> but let's make fun of this person crap hole, which is not good. But still, I feel connected to her. I we we have a, there's still a spark there, even though we don't physically see each other. So you can't, even though people say technology has made us more apart, it still can bring us together. Mm -hmm. Social media, even so, even social media has its pitfalls. It really, really does. There's some awful things about social media. But I also learned how to macrame on social media. I joined a beginning macrame group and I made two beautiful projects in the past couple of months that I've always wanted to macrame. You know, and I and I found these groups, they were showing pictures, some of them put YouTube links to the tutorials. I got on there and I made gorgeous stuff. You know, so so sometimes and oh and I was I was crocheting a blanket for my son a couple of years ago and I couldn't find I was like a half ball yarn short and I got on a crochet group and said does anybody have any of this in their stash and somebody mailed it to me from Montana I <laughs> didn't <laughs> charge me for it or anything I mean you know so social media has benefits you just Facebook have to be aware of it it's such a bad rap it really does and I I. I only have friends who I know. I have friends that are friends of friends that I know and trust. Mm -hmm. So my group is small. Mm -hmm. um, I've taken the time to go in and tell them that ads I didn't want were offensive or whatever I could come up with. I just click one of their things and they will disappear. Mm -hmm. I got rid of gambling apps that way. Mm -hmm. And I find it as a way that I interact just with people and they do the things I'm interested mm -hmm. in. Like my people, and we share funny things. Yeah. There's something called Indiana Nature Lovers that lifts my spirits. Yeah, birds and the yeah sunset. Oh, oh yeah, ask to join Indiana Nature Lovers. Some of them are like professional. They have uh, I've seen some pictures of blue parents and they just take your breath away. Oh my gosh, the little foxes. One little fox, the other little fox laying on top of the sibling's head. Oh my god! I, I have an Instagram sure. account I follow called the Dodo. That's really addictive. You click on it, and it's, it's, it's like um, nature. nature. It's like an animal work. story mm -hmm. about like yeah. rescued yeah. animals. Yeah. Like somebody rescued a dog that was starving to death, and now it's yeah. all happy and loving yeah. and yeah. running yeah. with a family. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, those things Sports are to make you feel connected in some ways. They're yeah. not yeah. the same. Yeah. Bird feeder, and I uh, when I sit in my chair, that's you know, I can I watch these birds and I get so mad because some chipmunk gets up there. Yeah, oh yeah. Away. We and do the best. Yeah. Best. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> but it, and that kind of connection is important too. I mean, connect, any connection with the world, with nature, with each other, those connections are what keep your brain firing and keep new, new neural pathways forming and keep elasticity and keep neuroplasticity. That kind of stuff is important. Um, and when you, I guess there's the, um, there's maybe the definition between isolation and, and being alone is when you don't feel connected to anything and you're just in your space, feeling so disconnected with the world, with your family, with old friends, even with the birds and the chipmunks, you know, if you don't feel connected, that's when your health is, your brain health is seriously impacted by your isolation. And it's easy to have that happen once you get to retirement age, that those spouses, um, you know, loss of friends who maybe they pass away, um, children move off, families get scattered. It's very easy to settle into that. Eh, it's okay. It's okay. And then... 10 years go by, 15 years go by, and you really start to close in on yourself if you don't make a concert effort to keep at least one connection out there that can be your lifeline to pull you out of that. Um, so I know that when I was working full time, uh, that was a lot, a big part of my role. And that role was a big part of my life, yeah. and my career. And what's defined you, who you are. Exactly. And so when I retired, I I was happy for a long time. <laughs> but then 
I started feeling like, what's going on here? I'm not doing anything meaningful. I mean, yeah, I'll be in with your grandkids and whatever, but, and I realized that I felt like I wasn't relevant. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to be relevant. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you have, you have to, it, as human beings, we need to feel like we have a purpose. Right. We do. We have a purpose mm -hmm. that's bigger than ourselves. You know, and, and when you're really wrapped into your career, or really wrapped into being a mother, or really wrapped into being a wife, right. or really wrapped into whatever it is that you're really wrapped into, um, and that changes, we feel like we've lost our identity. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's it's important to keep learning new things, keep opening horizons for yourself, try new things whether you don't like them. If you don't like that, try something else. Well, because of you, I'm going to start violin lessons in the Oh, see, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to one of my friends who who my you know, you know, used to get me done and go, no, I don't agree. And I'm going to say, let's get together and do some ensemble playing. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited, excited about it. I decide I'm going to wait till after this group is over, and then I'm going to take that and tell it with you. That's wonderful. Oh, excellent. You tell me how it goes. I know. Well, awesome. It's hard. I know. Well, I know. Well, I was a trumpet player in my majorette, so that's two totally different. Yeah. Pop on into trumpets. Yeah. It may seem very, very simple. I think I might be like yesterday for the first time. I'm like, wow, I'm good. And I'm not. But the noise came out. I can play a whole lot more notes on it than on the violin. Well, my friend who is 10 has his dream concert last night. And so we're going to play together. Oh. We're gonna, I'm going to go to their house after the lesson and bring them home. Have so you ever I'm played it at all before? No, I've oh, never no. played a string oh. instrument. No. Uh, so I'm not. excited about learning something new. But and that's learning something new. So that's, yes. that's taking in another aspect of the pillars of brain health is, is learning, learning something new. Right. Yeah, and learning. You said it and was your left and right. I thought, oh, well, I'm going to do that. Good. I'm, I'm excited. excited. I'm excited. Let me know how it Let's see. So we kind of covered everything on here, getting involved with activities that are new, kind of like my macrame Facebook group, learning a new skill like violin, um, just looking for opportunities to make friends with people. But during the pandemic, when you couldn't go out, I just kind of created a job for myself and decided that I want to leave all my kids' pictures scanned. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so I started out. One, it was fun wading back into them and organizing and sorting and labeling and making sure they knew what they were. And then Ancestry with my sister. Yeah. And, and going back and working at quite an extensive family tree and everything. Yeah, so I did that. That's too. like my job. Yeah. It's like your Wait, oh, oh, you need you need a purpose. You, yeah. need a, you need that intention. You need something that you're doing in your life, in your life that's intentional. You know, so that you feel like you are you are accomplishing something. You know, and that's a lot of people miss out on that by um, just kind of you know, not knowing where to start or really not like almost a bother or whatever. But there were mornings during the pandemic when at first when I wake up, I would have to force myself mm -hmm. to go upstairs to my computer and, and start doing it. But once you got into it, it's like falling down the rabbit hole. Right. I mean, it's fabulous. Don't you think it's that way sometimes with social engagements too? You think, oh, I do not want to go to this, oh, that whatever. Right. Right. But then you go and you're like, and you have to go, I'm so glad I went. Oh, you know, and then you've got to force yourself sometimes to do those things. <laughs> I think I mentioned earlier, you know, we all need a tribe. Uh, whether it's a tribe that's, that's your family or a tribe that's your friend group or uh, if you happen to be a, a church going person, your, your church clubs or your bunco group or whatever, right? So, a bunco group I belonged to when I was a kid, when I was a young mom. But, um, but those close ties, it really does help keep your mind sharp. And it's not just knowing a bunch of people, it's really forming those relationships that matter, keeping connected. So, how can you form deeper relationships? Um, there was a study 
that was done. And um, it's really amounting to spending time with people. The more time you spend with somebody, the stronger the relationship is. And a lot of people um, uh, there's have a ton of casual friends, you know, but it really takes a long time to develop a true friendship. It takes getting to know each other. It takes being vulnerable. It takes exposing yourself to another person, maybe sharing, um, you know, pieces of yourself um, so that you can find that, that little thing that connects you to that other person. Um, just knowing a lot of people isn't going to do it for you because you need to spend about 200 feet hours with a person before they're really your friend. But 200 hours, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. That's, that's a lot, lot of time. Jumps, yeah. yeah. Jumps yeah. And just like with the girl that you said, the young girl that you spent so much time with, I mean, you guys were spending quality time together when you were mentoring her. And through that time you spent together, a friendship blossomed. Uh -huh. And and that can happen in a lot of unexpected places, mm -hmm. you know. But it's just being open to that and leaning into those sparks when you feel that spark of connection to another person. I'm trying to make friends with my next door neighbor because when I'm in the game, she still had a husband who was sick, but he's been gone probably about a year now. And you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, I don't know exactly how to increase this friendship. Right now, she's on a walker because she had a 40 yard shot on me. And um, uh, in our apartment complex, we don't visit inside each other's apartments. We usually we have chairs sitting outside in the hallway. And that way, somebody comes walking by and they, they sit down and start talking. So our friendships are done through like the hallway, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't know. I, I will stop. I stopped and knocked on the door the other day because I said, well, I've been sick and I haven't seen you out. So I said, I just was worried about you. And, um, but you know, it does, unless I don't knock on her door, mm -hmm. she doesn't, you know, reciprocate. I see her a lot of times it's in the mail room, we're getting our mail. And that's usually the only time we see her, yet she lives right next door to me. Oh. So, yeah, so finding. And she's very isolated. She doesn't drive. You know, she doesn't have a car. And I know the daughter comes a lot of times on the weekend and takes her shopping. Yeah. When you guys do spend time together, do you talk about like things you like to do or I don't know. We kind of you? talk about nothing. I mean, I'll be yeah. nothing really important. Mm -hmm. Do you think she could still be grieving the loss of her husband? I, I don't know. Somebody had, you know, how real mystics are in, in a community like that. And somebody had told me her husband wasn't very nice to her. I, I don't know, know that. I, mm -hmm. You know, kids just be agreement. Is there any place like, like if I would invite somebody to have coffee, is there a place where you could say, hey, let's meet up well, I don't from the window or whatever? We have a community room. And I have actually, I notice that sometimes if somebody uh, rips in a wheelchair, and a lot of times we'll get somebody to go get hamburgers, and I noticed that she was eating a lot of the fast food. And so one day I thought, why don't we go to lunch together? I'll drive, you know? So we get in my car and of course it's bed. <laughs> Oh, oh, my oh, 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 I wonder if her daughter could give you some clues on things yeah. that would help you to be able to spark that friendship. Yeah. If there's like, if she likes to play cards or she likes to crochet or she likes yeah, to. Yeah, she, I, I have asked her a couple of times. We used to have kitchen twice a month, mm -hmm. but we had to stop that. And the other day we had one and I said, well, why don't you come to the kitchen? No, she said, I just can't sit still that long. Mm -hmm. That's an excuse, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this is kind of my, my job. This time. I mean, this is, I don't know why, but I just want to make friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious why people don't invite people in their apartment. I don't know. We don't. Can you break that? Not until I move my apartment. Why? <laughs> 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 you know, I live down the three bedroom house with full basement into one bedroom apartment. Uh -huh. 
And uh, right now my back hurts because I've been asleep this morning. Oh, but, um, I I think the whole idea is just that I have a, a folding chair outside my door. And a lot of times, I mean, I went to get my mail and I heard folks talking and I looked through and here's like four people sitting outside in the hallway. So I just went in there with an empty chair and sat down and we talked, you know. And so the, you know, I don't know if that's a way of it. They could get more people talking mm -hmm. in a group mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, if you go into somebody's apartment, you're not going to knock on the door to hear people mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother was in a situation like that, and that, that there was a little kind of an alcove, and later management made them put it, but they had chairs and they would sit, and it, it occurred to me it's sort of like the front porches in the olden times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to clean your house. No. You don't have to be worried that your house isn't better or whatever. Right. And you can get up and leave if you need to. Um, and she thought it was great. I mean, everyone loved it. But if you go through, and if the apartment is called here, you said you're right next to area in the uh, Edgewood Village apartment. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, that's where my mom lived. Oh, we got she live there now. No, no oh, she, she died about three yeah. years ago. We looked at that one. My mom was it, we, I'm in building one. There's four of buildings, but they're all connected. And building one is the best because it's very, very quiet up there. You know, I know many of, of let's see, the six people that live up there. But, um, and I've only been there a year and a half, so I haven't been there very long. Well, uh, speaking as a daughter who had a mother yeah. who wasn't reaching out to people, uh, especially after her, some of her friends she did connect with died, and she was like, I don't want to make any more friends because they just died. Oh, That's what we're doing right now. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And so I was like, <laughs> if, if another resident you guys been looking at me, I would have been thrilled. You know, yes, I really want to help my get my mother connected. Yeah, yeah, I think that that there's a little bit of um, fear involved um, with people when they live alone. That maybe nobody wants to be my friend. It's kind of that new kid in school kind of fear and oh, like brings you back. Yeah, my mother went through that. When she spent time at Meadowood, which is wonderful. Yeah. And she was sure that the ladies were talking about her at dinner. And I'm, oh my gosh, I remember. And I'm, and she was sure they were all college graduates. And she, oh. But there is kind of that fear that we all want to be loved and accepted and appreciated. And, you know, that, that, we, the fear of being rejected, rejected mm -hmm. or the fear of putting yourself out there and, and the other person not wanting you to. Um, and so overcoming that by, with her, she may be uh, very nervous around other people just because if she's, if her husband, you know, if he was mean to her, that's really easy to see why she might be, you know, nervous about making friendships. Maybe she, maybe they left, lived a fairly isolated couple life, who knows? But if you ask her daughter, you know, like what kind of interest is she going to wait until she comes over? You know? yeah. Do you guys yes. ever drink like um, iced tea or lemonade or anything like that in the hallways? Not in the hallways. Not in the hallways. Well, one time, um, no, no, no. a couple of years ago, um, our oldest person lives at Kenny Corner for me. She's 97. And uh, she's out in the social area. She's the one that gets the new group going on Monday night. But she invited some people over and she put a card table up and we had iced tea and um, uh, Girl Scout cookies. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a she's a Miss Social. She just she's got her neck in a brace right now. She fought fell and broke something. So you know, um, somebody was sitting. They were sitting outside her apartment. Walked up to her neck apartment was being clean. And I stopped talking to her for a while. But she's very very friendly. Very first person to knock on my door. Um, she's only got to go visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, connecting so other people are very country. friendly. There and others just isolate themselves. Yeah. And a lot of that I think it's a combination of, of fear and just lack of motivation. Yeah. Because in order to make friends, you've got to be a friend. And you know, I don't and I don't like either, but I, I I go down there on Monday night because sometimes I get a phone call, you know, because they need to, you know, and they called one night, they need a fourth person. And so I decided now, okay, this was Martha's thing. So in honor of Martha, I'm going every Monday night. You just take your own drink. But that's good. You know, it is. 
That's, I mean, that's good to have that ritual, like we're talking about, like I mentioned a couple of times, which I really want to get to this TED Talk. I'm sorry, I'm not No, no, no. I'm going to skip ahead, actually. I actually love it, but before I'm actually really, really talking. Yeah, right? I know. I want to, I want to share this TED Talk with you, but I'm going to. Okay. Oh, I thought this was an interesting stat. Um, even at the young age of 40, 20% of people over the age of 40 feel like that they are socially isolated, disconnected, just disconnected. And I would think that living in a community like what you're talking about, Mary Lou, would be really hard because if, if you, if the only place to socialize is in the hallway, really, then, then like that would be a big fear of about knocking on someone's door, I think. Well, I'm hoping we we did have a kitchen this Saturday before uh, Easter, mm -hmm. but the only people that came were the ones that normally show up in car games. You know, yeah, that's that's always mm -hmm. what happens. It's the same old, same old. And I uh, we have a lot of people because we had like five or six apartments go into during this. Uh, Academic, academic, and then they just they didn't fill them. They worked on them, and now I think they're all filled. So maybe a, maybe a group people. of people who always get together on a form of welcome committee. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so uh, it would be nice to have another basket. Mm -hmm. so, it would be nice to have another pitch in and, and try. And I mean, they put notes up all over the place. But mm -hmm. if I just moved in there, new. I was invited by Martha, of course, came over and said, we're having a kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. you should come. Right, right. Each yeah. one invited one. It's a yeah. personal invitation. And uh, so I don't know, I'm not sure who the, some of these people are, because I have actually asked people, and, you know, to say, like, did you just move in? And sometimes they'll say yes, or they'll say, no, I've been here for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's some people that have that just, there, we have a few people that are working 40 hour weeks, so they're still working. You only have to be 55 to move in. Oh, yeah. So we still have a few months. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's okay to be alone. I mean, can you tell the difference for yourself when you're um, like, when you want to be alone or you're alone versus where you're lonely? I mean, there's a difference. So maybe some maybe some of those people, um, you know, have other activities that they do or they go to places. Yeah. Or church groups that they belong to, or social clubs that they belong to. I know my dad was always big involved in the Eagles. You know, um, uh, just a lot of a lot of people have social things that they're involved in, and they're not they they're not lonely. They're just they just live alone. Um, but if it's impacting your well being, which sometimes it can, and then that's when you need to um, be able to tell the difference and make some kind of changes. Um, so, I mean, does everybody feel like they can tell the difference between loneliness and alone? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so too. Um, I think I want to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> the girls did this for me. I feel so bad because I would have probably. Well, we have the book. You have the book. You can read that. Yeah, yeah. We, um, we have a kind of. We touched on almost every one of those. Yeah. And actually, I thought about the wrong thing, but can't believe it would change how that works. You know, I still don't really feel I'm, I'm ready to even do that. Yeah, the, only, if the pandemic was a huge thing. Oh, there's one that says make sure your connections are intergenerational. There's your, your young friend. Mm -hmm. um, the digital connection. But volunteering, um, even volunteering in the background of things can make you feel connected uh, uh, for it. So even if it's not volunteering in person, even if it's, um, you know, organizing something like online for a group or if it's um, stuffing envelopes for a group or whether it's uh, um, something for, uh, you know, um, Kids with support groups or Alzheimer's support groups or um, uh, fundraising or whatever. If there's something that you feel passionate about, and put birds and this, you know, um, uh, even like doing something with the, for the Audubon Society or whatever, you know, just um, finding something that you feel passionate and connected about and then volunteering to make that even more um, part of you or ownership in it. 
Uh, oh, this is a good one. How about passing along some skills that you have? Like if you know how to play the violin or play the flute or uh, crochet or knit or macrame or whatever, um, teaching um, even your, um, your neighborhood children or maybe um, a, a group of school children or maybe just your neighbor, uh, you know, uh, maybe they want to learn a new skill or even you know, cooking, baking cakes, whatever. Um, sharing your skills. We all have great, a great vast of um, amount of knowledge and skills to share. Uh, we talked about having at least one trustworthy, reliable confidant. Um, I know you said, I don't need a pet. <laughs> <laughs> and not everybody needs a pet. I don't need a pet. I can really take care of myself and my husband. Um, and then reaching out when appropriate. You know, if you are feeling ever feeling isolated or lonely, make sure you do reach out, even if it's for professional support. Um, that's when the Zoloft might come in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah, yeah. So this is what I kind of want to really kind of end on. This is um, this is the last thing that we'll be able to look at. But I felt like this TED Talk was really good, and I don't like every TED Talk. Um, so I'm kind of a TED Talk snob. So I hope you guys think it's oh, awesome. Really oh, yeah. I use them in the classroom. Yeah. You just have to walk in. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. That is funny. Oh boy. That, that was okay. hysterical. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Loneliness is an emotional state that we have when we're feeling disconnected. But our need for connection is ingrained in our DNA. Loneliness is a signal, just like fight or flight, that something isn't right. Loneliness is a public health crisis. But one in five Americans suffer from loneliness, which means if you haven't personally suffered from loneliness, it's almost guaranteed that somebody you know closely has. It can cause depression, and it can even lead to premature death. But now more than ever, we're living alone. We're spending more time online and less time making meaningful in-person connections. So when emotional storms hit, things like losing a job or going through a divorce or a death, instead of leaning in towards our communities, we've learned to suffer alone. So today I'm going to offer one solution that will bring us more connection and can help cure the epidemic. When I was a kid, I had a really hard time fitting in. I wanted to do whatever I could to belong and to not feel lonely. All I wanted was to find connection. So my oh so wise adolescent self came up with a solution. I was going to be popular. <laughs> I carried this thought process throughout my teens. But the problem was the more I wanted to be popular, the more it fueled my need for attention and approval. And when I was 20 years old, as fate would have it, auditions for MTV's reality show, The Real World, came into town. Now, for a girl still starving for approval and attention, this was my ticket. Now, for some of us, when we think about reality TV, we don't really have that strong reaction. Never really watched it, don't quite get what all the fuss is about. But for others of us, we do have a strong reaction when we think about reality TV, and we generally fall into one of two camps. The first camp is like, you literally could not pay me enough to go on a reality TV Under show. Under that camp. In fact, yeah. reality TV yeah. is everything that is wrong with our society today. And then the second camp is like, go on a reality TV show? <laughs> Honey, I should have. 
my own reality TV show. <laughs> I would be the next Snooki for sure. But with a history like mine, I'll give you one guess which camp I fell into. And at 21 years old, I moved to Brooklyn as part of seven strangers came to live in a house. I love this quote by Jim Carrey. He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of. So they can see that it's not the answer. But how many of you have gone after a goal based off of the feelings you thought you would feel once you accomplished that goal? The real world didn't bring me connections like I thought it would. In fact, if anything, I was lonelier than I had ever been during those 15 minutes of fame. But this lesson propelled me into the work I do now, studying connection. And whether it's the events I produce or the show that I host or the coaching sessions I have, everything exists to create connection. Because here I am now, my oh-so-wise adult self, searching for what actually creates connection. And here's what I found. In order to feel connected, you need to feel seen, heard, and valued. You may have heard of blue zones. You may have heard of blue zones. Blue zones are areas all over the world where researchers have found that people live the longest and happiest lives. So everybody does this differently. Communities of like Loma Linda, California, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy. Some pray together, while others, they walk together. And others simply spend more time nurturing relationships with their families. But the one thing that they all do in common is they prioritize connection. They focus on their relationships. What I found is that these societies have created something that I call an anchor of connection. An anchor is created simply by spending quality time with people who see, hear, and value you. But they, uh, how do we create our own anchors of connection? I'm so glad you asked. The most powerful way to create an anchor is through ritual. Now, I know when we think about ritual, we generally think about religion or sacred ceremony, but today I want to redefine ritual as something that's not necessarily religious or sacred, but instead something that we're already doing on a day-to-day -day basis. The key to making ritual such a powerful tool for connection is that ritual is repeated action plus intention. When you combine repeated action and intention, ritual becomes ingrained in you just like habits do. The best places to find ritual are with your friends and families, in your intimate relationships, and within your communities. Now, we've been gathering around fires forever to storytell and connect. For me and my girlfriends, our couches act as a metaphorical fire that we gather around. Every Monday night, we throw in our leggings, we head to one of our houses, we pour ourselves some rosé, we pile onto the couch, and we just talk. We ritualize Monday nights as a time where we come to connect and fill our tanks for the rest of the week. And while plenty of Mondays, we're coming and we're talking about the things that are exciting and going well in our lives. But on lots of Mondays, we come with our tanks empty. Whether that's the small storms that have built up, just daily wear and tear, or the bigger storms, like going through a divorce or a miscarriage. But whether we're grieving or celebrating, we ritualize Monday nights as our anchor of connection. After Monday nights, I head over to my partner's house and we have a ritual that we've been doing for the past year or so. 
where before bed, we each say, the thing I love about you most today is, and then we both say something really kind about one another. Now, easy enough to do when we're feeling in love. Not that easy to do when we're in a fight. <laughs> In fact, when we first started this and we were in a fight and I would be angry, it would generally look like this. <clears throat> hey, babe, do, do you want to do the thing I love about you most? No. <laughs> okay, do you want to just like try it? Not right now, I'm not in the mood. Okay, maybe just maybe just once. Okay. The thing I love about you most today is how your eyes sparkle when you're rolling in the night. <laughs> 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 what what I could have never guessed this ritual would do is expand my capacity for kindness and compassion. And now when we're in a fight. Sometimes I even say the thing I love about him most first. <laughs> it's this ritual that has carried us through our storms. So when our fights could just as easily disconnect us and leave us both feeling lonely, instead we ritualized our anchor of connection. You know, it's interesting. Now that I know what blue zones are, whenever I'm traveling, I'm always looking for blue zone qualities. And recently, I took a trip to France with some of the same girlfriends who I spent Monday nights with. Landing in Paris was amazing and exactly like you think it was if you've never been. The cobblestone streets, the shutters, the windowsills with the flowers, the bakeries whispering, screw you, gluten-free diet. <laughs> You're not welcome here. In France, meals are rituals. So dinners, for instance, they start later and last longer. And whether it's two people or 10 people, you sit down and you enjoy the meal for at least two hours and usually three. The food takes a long time. No phones are out. And when the meal is over, you sit and you talk some more. Day in and day out, the French go back to the table for their ritualized anchor of connection. Our last stop in France was Nice. We arrived 12 hours after the Bastille Day attack, where the truck driver drove through the fireworks celebration, tragically killing 84 people. That was horrifying. It would have been so easy for everybody to retreat, to disconnect, to suffer alone. But instead, what we saw were storefronts and restaurants opening their doors. And even just 12 hours after complete tragedy, people went back to the table. They went back to their ritual. We weren't in the mood to go out that night. So we went back to the apartment. We put on our leggings. We poured ourselves some rosé. We piled onto the couch and we just talked. We went back to our ritual. Because in the face of a storm, in the face of disaster, in the face of complete tragedy, ritual acts as your anchor of connection. Now, my core desire to be liked and approved of, it might never go away. Just like your core desires might not either. But what I know now that I didn't know when I was 20 years old, praying that the real world was my answer to loneliness and my ticket to connection, is that connection isn't created by the things we don't get. Connection is created by the things we go back to. So my invitation to you today is simple. Don't do something new. Find something you're already doing with your friends and families or in your intimate relationships or within your communities. And do that thing over and over and over again. 
do it with intention. Do it, do it during the good times and do it during the mundane. So when the inevitable emotional storms hit, you have your ritual to go back to. You have your very own anchor of connection. Thank you. Did you guys think that was so? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was very powerful. I, um, I think those anchors of connection are super important. And it's kind of like what I was talking about with the taco chili night or the taco Thursday, chili night Thursday, um, the you know Sunday fun day, whatever it is that you have um, that you can, and with your group, your yoga Monday night group, start if you start taking that that as and make it more of an anchor for you that my intention is to build friendships my intention is to go there every monday night come hell or high water and build friendships basically that's what i decided um, when uh, <clears throat> martha was in the hot and you know rehab getting over that uh, we said okay we we need to still keep playing on women because that mm -hmm. is what martha likes so we've done it on her. I do have a card group that I that I was doing before I moved to Ellisville, and we we meet every every other Friday. We play uh, hand and foot, mm -hmm. and um, I haven't had to go the last two times. The one was I was I had a pneumonia shot and reacted to it. Oh, which kind of silly, but and so I wasn't feeling very good. But this this Friday is supposed to be another one, so I got to make sure I go to this one. Yeah, I don't want to lose those strengths. I've had uh, those strengths I've had, I bet, over 10 years. Yeah. And we do end up going back to those because I know that when, um, for instance, on the, the Taco um, Thursday, we had a really tragic suicide happen in our community. And um, it happened to be a Thursday night and or mm -hmm. Thursday morning when they found this young uh, man's body. And um, we all did the taco anyway and just tried and spent time together. And we, we don't even call it taco dinner, we just call it taco. Can you wait to taco tonight? <laughs> we'll see you at taco. You yeah. know, we don't even call it. My, and my son's family, my ex husband's family, they call it um, chili. chili. I'm going to go down for chili. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, it, it becomes your ritual. I remember when um, my kids were little, it was pretty much the tradition that when you would go to school to do pickup, you got out of your car and you talked to all the mothers oh. in the parking lot. You always did that. Or maybe after church, you have a certain group that you always kind of stand around and visit with before you get your cars and go home. Those little rituals, those little things are your anchors of connection in your community. And finding little pieces like that to connect you to people can be the difference between being alone and being lonely. Um, and and having purpose and not my own connections. When the pandemic started, um, I have a group of friends that we always got together. But people you know, they lived in Chicago. Somebody moved. You know, like we were not always together, but we would get together. But we couldn't during the pandemic. So my friend set up a Zoom. Yeah. And we every Friday night at four o'clock we would get on Zoom. And we talk to each other about our days or it's like a little happy hour. We talk about happy hour. Happy yes, hour. we get a happy hour everybody <laughs> drink a glass drink, of wine or whatever. Right, exactly. And we can do it. <clears throat> we still do it. Yes. See, that's awesome. Those those are anchors that, that connect you to people. Um, my son moved to Indianapolis, and so I hardly ever I get to see him. So he started instead of calling me, he FaceTimed me. Mm -hmm. Those little things, it, it gives you so when I'm talking, I don't get FaceTime calls, except for from him. But he never, and I never call him. We always FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And even if we're doing stuff, like I've waved my uh, phone on the counter and he's looked at the ceiling because I'm making dinner or whatever, you know. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's just those little rituals, those little things matter when it comes to how connected you feel with your world and with your people. So, we're past time. Is it 2.30, right? Okay, yeah, I'm a little late. So I didn't do, we didn't do active listening. We did, I didn't do a lot of active listening. We did a lot of active listening. We paid attention. We used good listening skills. And it was a pleasure spending some time with you guys. And I hope that there was something that you found of value um, from our session today. And next week is movement. Next class is movement. So we 